be to, to uh, uh, bring a message with uh, my friend Jacqueline. We've had a lot of conversations through the year. Uh, and uh, I remember Jamie, uh, I think you sent me an email or, or just said, hey, by the way, are you interested in doing, doing the 2,000 years in 20 minutes? And I thought, that's going to work for me because I'm ADD. So I can cover 2,000 years in 20 minutes. <laughs> and then it's this little um, um, nudge. And Jacqueline comes in and we're having a conversation about something else. She said, um, would you be interested in like preaching with me? And I, I'm going to add that. I think there was, there was a corner and I was backing up into it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and it, was just, it was just one of those things. It was like, hey, let's give this a try and see what happens. Because, you know, I like throwing grenades in the middle of the room just to see what happens. And what I loved was Jacqueline's response to yeah, all and of that. Yeah, and it's two words that you guys have probably said maybe once or twice in your lifetime. I can't. Sound, sound familiar? Yeah. Quickly followed yeah, with I won't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, my attitude was really similar to a lot of people in the Bible. A lot of people who got asked to do things and they were like, oh, are you, are you sure? Am I the right person? Uh, I don't think I'm deep in my faith. Maybe another time. Um, it, the Israelites, Jonah, who had to be swallowed up by a whale for him to say, actually, yeah, I can. So, you know, I stayed away from large bodies of water for a little bit. <laughs> and then I said yes, and not out of fear of being swallowed by a big fish, but because I think we're all continuously growing into our faith. Uh, and it would be cool to watch someone do that on stage. So I'm your guinea pig. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but she did say to me, she said, Dwayne, I don't mind if you ask me the odd question, you know, to, to probe a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Just don't make it too personal. Yeah, I sternly so. said to him, looked at him and I said, no emotional triggers today. <laughs> Do not curveball me that way. Yeah. So you guys can help me if I start to get a little bit close, just kind of point at me or throw something or anything else. And by the way, you know, I really do appreciate Robbie's thought on uh, rest. But if you start sleeping, I have something in my hand. <laughs> just a warning. <laughs> Uh, so what we're going to do today is something a little different. It is talking about the real church experience. What is Christ Church? What does it mean? Uh, what does it look like? Um, and the, the, the fun thing was is, um, I thought, okay, 2,000 years in 20 minutes. That, that's doable. But then, you know, uh, uh, Jacqueline and I were talking about how to do this. And then, you know, I thought, well... Let's start doing some research. And I love that because I need to know everything before I can speak about it. So if you're wondering, yes, yes, I do know everything already. So I, <laughs> there's tons of stuff about Christ Church um, and Christ Church after death, but I really want to start with the origins of worship. So I took to the Old Testament. Um, so I started with Moses when he freed the Israelites. And one of the first things that they did so that God would be among them is that they created this tent of meeting. So God was there all the time. And then I read further, and I'll be very honest here, uh, it got a little monotonous. Like, there's a lot of pages with very specific rules about this tent of meeting. Like, this goes on the left, this goes on the right, you need this, 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 and this for materials. And I was like, wow, like, that doesn't seem like the way that I worship. And there's also this rule that you can't actually go into the tent of meeting because the power and the holiness of God was so powerful that you basically just die. It was, it was that big. And so I was looking at it more, and I'm like, this just, it doesn't seem quite right to me. Like, why isn't that the way that we do things today? So I took the Bible in context, which, by the way, you should always do. Very helpful. Um, and I thought of God as the Father and the Israelites as kids. And that made it a little bit easier to understand. Because if you think of a child's first years of life, there's tons of parameters, there's tons of guidance, there's tons of rules, there's tons of boundaries, because they're new to life. And that's what the Israelites were like. They were enslaved for 400 years, and then all of a sudden they had all this freedom. So they needed the rules and the boundaries for religion in order to grow closer to God in the right way. So yes, there were barriers, but they were necessary. If there weren't, it would kind of be like sending your preschooler to college. Like you might want to, you might see their potential, but they need to do the steps to get there. And you might actually think they're ready for that, but... 
you they're know, not. They're not. <laughs> it's the way it is. You know, something strikes me when you were talking about um, a lot of the rules. What happens when um, uh, children, especially, have a rule in front of them? What's their first reaction? They break it. <laughs> Why? Camp director, two years, I can yeah, say. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, so the interesting thing is, like, up on the slide behind me, you see, like, the end of the story. You see a list of things that we want to lead into. And I'm going to put this back at the end so you're going to understand, but I really wanted to put this out here right at the very beginning um, just to show that um, uh, there is another side of the story. Yes, all through the Old Testament, um, you know, it was one series of issues after another. People didn't have the attention span to, to stay um, focused on, um, on developing that relationship to Christ. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, you know, and Jacqueline had mentioned, and it was in the song earlier, about that barrier between us and God. Uh, and Jamie did a great job talking about that whole idea about death and resurrection. And when Christ uh, died, um, uh, there was the veil between the rest of the temple and the Holy of Holies that was ripped from top to bottom, opening up that area of freedom, opening it up so that we do have that direct connection um, with God. Yep, so the church after Christ, uh, it was really cool at first, really great. Uh, there was this one part in Acts where 3,000 were committed to Christ in one day. Because the news was so good, right? Like, it was that good. Um, but, as you can expect, there were complications. Um, there was persecutions over hundreds of years for Christians. Uh, their books were burned, they were murders, their practices were greatly misunderstood. Um, and then Christianity became dominant. And that should sound like really great news, like Christ's message was everywhere. But with that came even more complications, as you can expect. There was a battle for power to own the message, to own the gospel, to own the good news. Uh, to use it as a resource for control, um, it became really heavily mixed with politics. So the desire for power kind of got mixed in with this image of Christ's church and with that, it wasn't quite the image that, uh, that Christ intended. Um, and that pattern can still continue today. I mean, what I hear about the church from people in, in my generation who don't go to church who, who, or who have had little exposure, um, that it's a formality rather than a spiritual experience, uh, that it's political, that it can be corrupted. Um, I did a survey a few months back for young adults, and I found some really interesting stuff about their perspective on religion. Um, so I asked a question, what keeps you from faith? What separates you? And the top answer was the institution of religion, the church. 62% agreed that religion is more abused than it is used well. So the question I asked myself after reading that and after looking at mm -hmm. the history of the church is, are they wrong? Are some churches still corrupt a little bit? Yeah. Um, are some more based on political? Yes. Do some drive fear into the hearts of people in the name of Christ? Yeah. So that does still continue today. So yes, they aren't wrong, but they also aren't all right because we're in a place like this. Hmm. Yeah, I, and I, I, a number of years ago, um, I did some thinking around, so what is it? What is going on around the church? Why are your problems. Has anyone ever been to a church where it was difficult for you? Has anyone been hurt by the church? And I think we're all on that, that same kind of a, of a perspective. And uh, for me, as I, as I reflect on it, I really do believe that it is more centered around um, man or, or people wanting to have a certain level of control. Uh, and the best way to do that, because we are living in a guilt-based society, is to put on more and more guilt, more and more, um, you know, showing people how they're not measuring up. And even into some of the messaging, it's, it's how you don't measure up and how we can uh, start to move forward. And rather than looking back, as I realize I really have to replace that projector back there. I can't see. Um, so that guilt moves into obligation, and then the obligation moves into a sense of control. And if you follow in line with all of those things, then and only then do you get that whole area of acceptance. Has anyone ever seen that in other places? Maybe the more difficult question is, 
um, and the conversation I'd love to have with you. <laughs> Do you see that here? Maybe I don't want to know the answer to that one <laughs> right at this particular uh, moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your experience been? I've been really lucky. Like, I I've gone here for my whole life. Um, and to me, that that's not where I go, or that's not where I go. <laughs> um, to me, I go to a place where we just celebrate God's love, where you're invited to um, invite him into your heart and accept his grace. Um, it's a place, it's not even a place, it's a people. Um, it's a people. It, you, when I come here and I also see people outside of church, I see the model, the way that we behave in here and the way that we teach in here. To me, that's church. That's church even if it's not in this building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so as I, as I continue to reflect on, on all of that, um, I guess I've seen a, a shift. And it is about reorienting. It is about changing. You know, the Old Testament really does talk about the law and living according to that law. And so people's faith became that system of beliefs that became that way of behaving just out of the law. Um, and along with that comes an awful, lot of, an awful lot of guilt because the reality is no one is going to measure up to all of those laws. Has anyone ever been able to measure up to all those laws? Yeah, that, that's the thing, right? We, none of us can. But when Christ came and that veil was split, um, he came to change. He came to bring that new life uh, and move our faith away from the, just the system of beliefs more into a way of living. So like Jacqueline was talking about, when she sees people wandering around um, during the week, she sees people behaving the same way they do on a Sunday morning, um, which is great. It is about Christ. Um, changing you and growing you so that um, it is more of a way of living and it is out of, out of grace as well, which is really cool. So the question is... This how is, is a curveball question. We didn't plan this. <laughs> uh, how, has, how has Christ changed you as a result? I think that one of the first steps to accepting Christ in your heart is accepting your own imperfection mm. and realizing that that's okay. I found, so I, I've, I've been working at the church, so obviously I've spent a lot more time here and a lot more time reading the Bible, a lot more time going to scripture and things like that. And I just, there's so many imperfect people in the Bible and like way worse mistakes than I've made. So I'm not trying to pass the blame or anything like that, but um, I guess I'm saying that Christ loves you no matter what. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah. What have been a lot of our conversations through the summer? Pardon? What have a lot of the conversations, like between you and I, been about this summer? Um, I ask a lot of questions. Um, f for me, I ask... Actually, she asks more questions than I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to know, I think I said this, I, I like to know things before I, I really go deep into them and take them into my heart. Um, so I, I like to ask a lot of questions about... Um, about the specifics of the Bible, like, well, if this happened here, then how did this happen here, or, or things like that. So that's been my interest over the summer, and I found the more I got to know the nature of Christ and the, the good nature of God, um, the more I came to accept him into my heart and accept that yeah. this is a father of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Debbie had a conversation this week with a young lady. Uh, I'm going to have her and share her story. And, and for me, it starts to, to change um, how we look at things and how we do with things. Okay, that's right, I forgot. Yeah, so if you wouldn't mind. I think that um, what both Dwayne and Jacqueline are talking about, that the church is so much more than a building. Mm. And, uh, and I also think, I think it's Mother Teresa who said that the epidemic, the disease of our time is loneliness. And so one of the ways that our community has uh, tried to bridge that gap where people can feel very lonely mm -hmm. is by offering online services. So you'll see that every Sunday, most Sundays, we'll say hello to the people who are watching online. And right now we have a community, there's folks who come here regularly who maybe can't be here on a Sunday morning, so we'll tune in. There's also a wider community of people who haven't always even ever been here before. And uh, we have from 20 to 60 or so on a Sunday morning who will watch online. 
And this, this week I had an opportunity to meet a young woman who's been doing just that, who had not come to North Bramley but was going through some things in her life and really thought this, this connection, this life, this life with Christ was something that she was seeking but not sure how to go about it. One of the things with online was that she began to be able to watch and sort of see some of, of what we as a community explore, some of our struggles, those imperfections, you know, some of the ways that we live that it's not, you know, about trying to, to, to meet a certain standard and rules, but mm -hmm. really enter into life the way that yeah. Jesus enters into our lives. And so she called and said, like, I've never been to your church and I've watched online. Is it okay if I come and talk with you? And well, of course, it's okay and welcomed her in um, this week and you know, got a chance to connect and hear some stories. I guess for me, you know, no matter whatever end up, ends up happening, um, whether this person's ever able to come on a Sunday morning at this current time she works on Sundays, and so that may never be a possibility for her, or at least for a while. Um, but no matter what happens, we got to be the church yeah. together. Because yeah. yes, she met with me, but it was the people of North Bramley, this community of everyday, ordinary people growing in the way of Jesus, following God out in the community yeah. that she wanted to connect with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened this week. And that's the power, yeah. I think, of what the church for 2,000 years, roughly, has been about, that connection and invitation into life. And I'm just so grateful that she reached out yeah, and we got yeah. to do that today. Yeah, thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's I think it's the building that scares people sometimes. Like it's so cool that we're able to connect online so you can get a sneak peek of what we're really about cuz um, by the outside you don't always know what happens on the inside of a church. So it really is the building that scares people, not Christ. How could you be scared of unconditional love and forgiveness like <laughs> right? <laughs> um, now Dwayne, you spoke on Wednesday, we have these leadership meetings on uh, Wednesday afternoons, and you spoke of a story about your dad uh, and your experience with Christ Church, and I was wondering if you'd like to speak to that. No. <laughs> but he will. I wrote it down, so. <laughs> yeah. It's in Jacqueline's notes, it's so, you know, ink. this is the way it's got to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, we were having a conversation, a uh, uh, leadership article that uh, Jamie had come across, and, and we were uh, talking about um, guarding your heart as a leader and making sure that um, your connection with Christ was sound and strong. And, you know, I, after I read it, I, I have to admit, I read through it and said, yeah, got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, I'm good. I'm ready for the meeting, so I'm going to be prepared for the meeting. Um, but then, uh, as I started back into, into working, uh, my mind wandered, and I thought of um, my dad. And I was, I was, I'd like to say a little boy, um, but I was uh, about uh, Cam's height and size, so I wasn't really little, um, but I was a beanpole, not necessarily like now. Um, and... Uh, we were sitting, uh, like I was sitting in the front seat of our church. This particular church, uh, Dad and I had founded um, back, um, well, 1981. It was a long time ago. Uh, founded the church in 1981, and um, uh, after a year and a half, we had uh, talked about building, but, you know, nobody was going to who uh, give us the money in order to build a new facility, being a year and a half old church. They actually literally laughed at us when we did that, we talked about it. Um, just a series of extraordinary events had happened. Um, the church had grown from uh, about 13 families through uh, to about uh, 300, 350 people at the time. And um, uh, it was time, uh, there were people there that felt that um, they were a better leader and a manager than my dad. And they were having that conversation in an open meeting. And like, I'm, I'm telling you, um, the first uh, 45 minutes of that meeting, I was getting more and more angry. Um, and nobody likes me when I'm angry. Um, but I was getting more and more angry. I was getting more and more uptight by listening to some of the back and forth. And the that kept going through my mind was, this isn't right. We need to do something here. And 
And I sat there and I just watched Dad's behavior. And he stood um, calm, listened to all that was going on, allowed everyone to have a voice. Uh, and then I remember, I remember exactly who it is. Um, I remember turning around and looking at them while they said, if we go out into the parking lot, I'm sure we can solve this issue really quickly. Why don't you no. Not Christ Church, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, just going back to what Christ Church is to me, I think it has to do with um, a celebration of good news. And the good news here was that they had 300 families and growing. How is there conflict within this? How is there conflict within the spread, the rapid spread of good news? Um, and it's just, it's, it's in our history as well. Um, the way I spoke about the persecutions and um, everything following that afterwards. People tend to complicate things when it's so simple. Unconditional love, grace, and forgiveness. Like, come on, people, right? <laughs> It's also about a discovery and a revival of hope. Um, it also has to do with, um, and like I said before, a people, not a place. Um, so yes, the building was there. They had everything ready to go, um, but something wasn't quite right with the people. Um, there was a disconnect from God's message. There was a disconnect from Christ's hope and Christ's love um, and Christ's forgiveness. What do you want people to come away with from today? I guess I would want you to go away with the idea that you can bring the church anywhere you go. Um, and that doesn't mean like standing at one of your meetings and preaching from the Bible and you know telling them the Ten Commandments, but it just means the way that you act. Um, I've always been scared of, of talking about my faith um, for fear of coming off a little bit too preachy, but um, I've been told this kind of over the summer repeatedly that it's not what you say, but it's, it's how you act. When people see you acting Christ-like, people want to know why. People want to know what makes you so upbeat. People want to know what makes you so positive, so, so um, good with conflict and things like that. So I'd want you to come away with the idea that bring the church with you. Bring the church with you tomorrow, Monday morning, and see what happens. Um, you can live Christ-like wherever you are doesn't have to be just here. This is just a building. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think about what the church means to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, um, the church means to me um, spending time with Jacqueline, um, having her ask me a ton of questions about what does this mean in the Bible? You know, why is this important? What's the context around that? Mm -hmm. So that she can turn around and go out and have a conversation with her friends about, uh, and maybe feel a little more prepared mm -hmm. to have a conversation mm -hmm. around that. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, uh, being around with um, a lot of you, um, you all have helped to change um, um, just my, who I am. Um, as a result of being around here. There's people in this room that would be very upset with me that if I mention them by name, um, but uh, I love watching them because they're here, they're engaged, but their real work is um, while they're working with coworkers during the week and having conversations with them and sharing Christ while they're, while they're doing it. They're here serving, they're encouraging. Um, uh, it just really changes me you know, being here with Jamie and Debbie, um, it has been uh, a real honor um, because both of these lovely people have encouraged, challenged, um, and spend um, a ton of time uh, getting to know who Christ is. And it's because, because of things like that, it is why we are able to move forward and make a difference in this world. This place is different. Mark and I had a, Mark Willard sitting in the back corner over there, who's a new grandfather, by the way. Yeah. Of course, I can't just say Mark, because Sue's involved there too. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> just a little bit, yeah. Uh, uh, but I remember Mark and I having a conversation about this place and why it's different and how it's different, and he termed it um, out of a book that he had read about kind of like an island out in the ocean. 
because we are trying to do all that we can to live in this whole idea of unconditional love, loving people for who they are, what's going on. It doesn't really matter. Giving them the ability to make different choices, um, which is all absolutely wonderful. There's that freedom that comes along with that when we're making our own choices. We believe we've got that kind of a freedom. And then we feel fulfilled as a result. And I think back to, to my dad in that moment. You know, here he was, and he just heard somebody really and ready to defend um, who he was and, and what had happened there in the church. And um, I just remember sitting there, because I'll, I'll tell you, I was ready to go. Like, I was ready to lead that church. And I looked up at Dad, and I remember a tear coming down his cheek. And he took the moment to smile at his little boy and resigned on the spot. He said, do you know what? When I arrived here, I didn't come to build the Wesleyan Church, Reformed Baptist, conservative, anyway. He didn't come to build that church. He came to build Christ Church. And he was willing to walk away from the job that he had to do all that he could to protect Christ Church. And that's, that's who we are. And that's what we are talking about here. Something to go beyond the day-to-day, -day, going away from focusing on a Sunday morning to focusing on what we're doing during the week and coming together to celebrate all that, that God has done through us during the week. You know, rather than just coming to an event, we want to come to church to be encouraged to lead us forward. Rather than just focusing on a faith decision, we want to focus on a series of decisions. So when did it ended up happening to that church? Isn't this great? Turns the tables on me. I love it. Mm -hmm. That's um, not even written down in ink. See, the, the, the bad part about it is um, it, because of that one event, um, the church went from three, 350 people mm -hmm. um, to about 150. They took eight years to start growing again and showing that life again. But they grew again. But they grew. Revival of hope. And they continued to grow, and they still continue to grow, and right now they are probably the leading church in that uh, tribe uh, right now. Uh, they have, um, well, about 1,200 people on a Sunday morning. They give away $120,000 a year to their community partners. Uh, they impact 350 or so children around the world because <laughs> they move faithfully attending to learning about the way. They move from faithfully serving to serving God at wherever they happen to have been. Have gone away from thinking just about heavenly reward, a future, a future promise, to living out Christ's message every single day. Christ said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Mm -hmm. That's Christ's church to me. This is Christ's church to me. So I just wanted to invite you to turn to the people next to you, you. Uh, whoever is around, partner. Group of three, we won't judge you, it's okay. <laughs> and I want you to ask yourself and uh, tell the person beside you, what does Christ Church mean to you? Um, sometimes it's really hard to find the words about why we keep coming back here. Um, but when we draw it back to love, grace, guidance, and the celebration of it all, it becomes a little bit easier. So I just want to invite you now to have a little bit of time to talk with your partner beside you about what Christ Church is. And then after about... 70 seconds, Leah's going to come and sing. Yes, yeah, she is. <laughs> 